Okay, hello, um, good morning. Um, I'm Martin Wynn from the University of Oxford. Um, I'm the National Coordinator for Clarin in the UK. Um, and um, I'm going to be chairing this session. Um, it's a session of four five minute paper presentations. Um, the text of these papers um, is available already in the conference proceedings, which are on the conference website. And um, sorry, so let's start sharing. There we go. Um, and the slides that you'll see are also available linked from the programme. Um, the papers in this session represent two of the conference themes, uh, resources, in the case of the first paper, and this is a theme that will reappear in um, further papers in the conference, and then the following three papers are research use cases. So um, the way that this works is that after all four presentations, we'll have a question and answer session. Uh, please put your questions in the chat channel on, uh, on Zoom. Uh, put them in at any time. Uh, don't wait till the end, because as you've seen from the last session, uh, there won't be time if you put them in at the last minute. So put your questions in as soon as you think, think of them, and I'll keep an eye on that channel. Um, I'll control the slides, so speakers, please tell me when to advance the presentations uh, to the next slide and you will be strictly limited to five minutes each. First, we have um, Thomas Eyevets, uh, as you may have seen, the recipient of th this morning of the Clarin Stephen Crowther uh, Award for Outstanding Achievement. He's presenting on behalf of a long list of, um, of co-authors um, on the topic of um, Parliament um, comparable corpora of European parliamentary data. So over to you, Thomas. Uh, thank you, Martin, for the introduction. So as Martin said, I'll, I'll shortly present the Parliament project. Uh, can we just go to the next slide, please? Uh, so this this was a so-called mini project from Clarin, supported by Clarin Eric. Uh, I think the first of its kind, where Clarin actually supports the construction of uh, resources and pools. Uh, it lasted just uh, about a year. And well, the motivation was to gather parliamentary corpora so that uh, those interested, the scientists could present, uh, could, sorry, could investigate uh, various crises, uh, starting with the COVID-19 epidemic. But in general, it is a, um, a much wider project than that because the, the completed corpora tools can be used for any other research on parliamentary data. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Uh, so the implementation itself went into phases. In the first phase, the, the core proposers uh, presented, well, compiled version one of the corpora. This was only with four languages. And we released it on, on the Clarin repository, the Slovenian Clarin repository. And then stage two, uh, there was another call for who is interested in providing corpora of their language. And we were very happy to get so many respondents, 13 in all. Um, and well, uh, in the second stage, we produced, they produced rather, uh, the corpora for their own countries. Uh, the second version was released towards the end of the project, so it could take part in the Helsinki Digital Humanities Hackathon. And in that um, point, we got uh, quite a bit of useful feedback on problems with version two. So the final version that was released in the scope of the project was 2.1, which contains 17 corpora. Uh, so 17 parliamentary corpora from, from European countries. Uh, altogether with 16 languages and about half a billion words. Okay, so the final results were uh, two, uh, two entries into, in the repository. One was the complete set of corpora, and the other one was, again, the complete set of corpora, but this one with uh, added linguistic annotations. So you have the plain text version, and you have the uh, linguistically annotated. Uh, the corpora are also integrated with no sketch engine and context, so two uh, pretty powerful concordances, which are uh, available on the Slovenian Clarin infrastructure, and also through a dedicated instance of Parlameter, which is a kind of um, platform for investigating uh, what has happened in, in a parliamentary um, session, or maybe a longer time than that. 
Uh, next, next slide, please. Uh, we use GitHub extensively uh, during the project. So in addition to what you can find in the Clarion repositories, you also have this uh, GitHub project in which you can find the various interesting things like the schemas we used, uh, quite importantly, samples of our corpora we produced also in uh, not only in the original XML uh, T compatible format, but also in derived uh, various derived other formats, which are maybe more immediately useful. Uh, also the complete set of scripts that we use to not maybe to produce the corpora, but definitely to validate them and to convert them into these um, into these formats and also some derived metadata. Next, please. So uh, these are the countries that uh, were, uh, which took part in the parliament project. Uh, and we can go to the next slide. So you see them in a bit more detail. So these are the codes, the, peri the period that the corpora cover. So we weren't too strict as long as they, uh, as long as they uh, contain the COVID period, which is this uh, dotted uh, vertical line, which is I think November 2019, uh, which is kind of the start of the COVID period. And we also wanted to have uh, a bit of historical data to serve as a reference corpus so you could, so people can compare uh, the pre-COVID and post-COVID part of the corpora. And as you can also see, the size of the corpora varies considerably from English, which has 100 million, and down to Hungarian, which only has, well, a couple of uh, hundred thousand words. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we included quite a bit of information into the corpora, and I don't really have time to go into the details here, but you can get a lot of info about who's been speaking and what their, uh, let's call them attributes of the speakers were. Uh, also transcriber comments and then lots of linguistic annotation, which is uh, unified. It all uh, is all based on the universal dependencies framework. So next slide. Uh, so uh, I very briefly presented your uh, the parliament project, and now in the next stage, because we will have a continuation project, we will do quite a bit of uh, new things like collecting new corpora, extending no corpora, but also enriching the corpora and using the corpora in various ways. So I'll conclude with that. Thank you very much. So the uh, the second paper in the session, uh, we have uh, Andreas Utka um, on behalf of his co-authors on corpora for bilingual terminology extraction in cybersecurity domain. Okay, hi. I will present here the a corpora for bilingual terminology extraction in cybersecurity domain. Uh, you see the team of the project is four linguists, a programmer, and a cybersecurity scientist. There are also two universities involved. It's uh, Vitotas Magnus University, Mikolas Romeri University, funded by Research Council of Lithuania. And the data will be deposited to Clarion LT repository. So all the relevant logos you see, see in the slide. Next, please. As the, the main aims of the project, uh, uh, project uh, three, so to prepare language resources for BITE uh, to apply current bilingual terminology extraction methods, which currently are deep learning methods, and uh, create an English-Lithuanian term base of cybersecurity terminology. Uh, but uh, for the Clarion Conference and, and the paper, we present just first step of the project, that's preparation of language resources for bilingual terminology extraction. Next, please. Uh, why cybersecurity domain? <clears throat> uh, because we think that uh, for today's digital world, uh, this is particularly relevant. The domain is also very dynamic, uh, lots of new terminology, and it's inconsistent, at least in Lithuanian. So it, Lithuanian uh, cybersecurity terminology needs uh, standardization and cleaning up. Next, please. And uh, what is BITE? BITE is understood as a method when terms and their translations are extracted from parallel or comparable texts. Uh, from parallel corpora, uh, this uh, term extraction has been already 
been applied for, for several decades, uh, but the importance of comparable data is increasing. Next, please. And uh, in this slide, you see the advantages uh, and disadvantages of parallel and comparable data. Uh, for parallel data, it's usually influenced by the source language. Uh, there's usually a shortage of parallel data. For example, we, for example, sorry, <laughs> for example, uh, we only have got uh, EU documents and uh, it's also expensive to build because you need uh, aligning comparable data. It, it's more natural, there's more data available and uh, normally data is more diverse, it's cheaper to build, but it's more difficult to do bytes. And for parallel data, it's easier to do bytes. Next, please. Okay, so there's a scheme of the corpora that will be uploaded to the Clarion repository. You see the corpora being numbered by one, two, three, four, and five. So it's, of course, parallel corpus, uh, comparable corpus, uh, and uh, training corpora, three, four, and five. Next, please. And there's a uh, in this slide, you see that text types in corpora are more diverse in comparable corpus. So yeah, in parallel corpus, we just got uh, legally binding key documents, which is uh, decisions, regulations, uh, and, uh, and so on. Uh, and also recommendations and um, all sorts of summaries and reports as non-legally binding documents. Uh, in comparable corpora, we get media files, academic files, next, next to the legal stuff. And we can have uh, a bigger corpus, of course, like 4 million words corpus, I guess, uh, just 1.4 million word corpus. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, um, Andreas. Um, the third paper is going to be um, uh, presented in video form. Um, the speakers aren't with us today, but they've provided a, uh, a video uh, five minutes long. Uh, so this is from Rosalba Nodari and Luisa uh, Corona on how to perform linguistic analysis of emotions um, in a corpus. Um, sorry, how to perform linguistic analysis of emotions in a corpus of vernacular semi-literate speech with the help of Clarin tools. So, research linguistics has shown how speakers can manipulate language in order to manifest feelings and evoke emotions in their listeners. In fact, emotions is not confined to the tarot domain of the subjectivity, but it is usually expressed through interaction. The research on the language of emotion has been conducted, has been conducted sorry, using different digital humanities tools, and a challenging file of inquiries represented by a classical means of expressing feelings and emotions. Crucially, this communicative practice was experienced even by people with the basic literacy. Letters are written by speakers with basic literacy or share a set of linguistic features that have been analyzed by linguists. However, they pose several problems for research with digital tools because they reflect the improper written habits of the writers. Furthermore, investigation like sentiment analysis usually required adaptation and first pass cleaning of the data coming from written text. The scope of this paper is then to propose to the clarin community a case study that can be used to test and implement the clarin resources. Our aim is to analyze how uh, Michela Margiotta, a literate woman from Apulia, affected by tarantism, express emotions in her letters to the anthropologist Annabella Rossi. The epistolary of Margiotta to Annabella Rossi spans around 60 years, from the late 50s to the mid 60s, and in the 70s, Rossi published the letters received from Margiotta in a book entitled Lettere da Matarantata. This document has been regarded as an important documentation of women's writing. Uh, in uh, so-called uh, Italiano Popolitario, a substandard variety of Italian uh, language used by illiterate and semi-literate people. The epistolary of Margotta consists of uh, a total of 65, let 65 letters. 20 letters were dictated to a more literate person, whereas the other 45 were written directly by Margiotta. In a preface, uh, Annabella Rossi identified several recurring, recurring themes in Margiotta's letters, but the whole corpus is characterized by a tension between Margiotta and the anthropologist. For Margiotta, the letters were a possibility to construct a bond with the 
a woman, a woman that at least in appearance was interested in her personal story. So with her uh, writing practice, uh, Margiotta tried to reach a common ground of shared emotion with the anthropologist Annabella Rossi. As said before, uh, when researching uh, linguistically on emotion, digital humanities tool can help in detecting specific patterns such as keywords in context or general emotion encoded in the text. Nevertheless, in this case, we are facing a corpus of a semi-literate woman characterized by misspelling, uh, vernacular forms, and other phenomena of the uh, Italiano Popolare. Given the above, uh, Margiotta's written practice, but in general, semi-literate written practices, can be problematic for linguistic analysis. As uh, for an example, uh, automatic basic uh, sentiment analysis tools, such as the one that can be found in Wayang, are not suitable for this corpus because uh, Margiotta vocabulary cannot be compared to the generic database typically used for sentiment analysis. In this respect, Margiotta corpus exacerbates the problems that are faced when dealing with the vernacular forms. Again, another problem regards the different written solution uh, used by Margiotta because she is not consistent with her lexical solutions and uh, sometimes she tends to write uh, complex utterances as a monogrammatic item, whereas other times she merge uh, all script forms. In this regard, uh, analysis of frequencies and keyword in context is particularly problematic. Uh, for example, the use of stop word is uh, not sufficient because it tends to eliminate part of the lexeme. Like and uh, additionally, the statistical analysis of frequencies cannot deal with different written forms that can uh, be counted for several times. Finally, the style of Margiotta letters is characterized by the use of construction strategies typical of the oral domain. So part of speech tagging and dependency parts in tools often mm, can encounter some difficulties and uh, inconsistencies. With this proposal, we want to offer Clarin a possibility to reflect uh, on that test. Uh, in fact, uh, during the year, Clarin infrastructure has helped many researchers in dealing with non-conventional objects that pose unexpected issues in link. In this case, uh, the usage of digital humanities tool can still present limits that uh, often outweigh the pros. But Michela Maggiotta Corpus can be seen as an almost perfect opportunity to develop tailored tools for linguistic analysis uh, because uh, this corpus comprises several documents from a single writer collected over time. Uh, thus, it avoids additional complications such as uh, regional variation or speaker uh, idiosyncrasies, uh, which is then likely to simplify the tools developing process. Um, in this respect, this case study will therefore allow to develop some basic guidelines which can then be used to analyze other illiterate and semi-literate corpora of vernacular uh, speakers. And thank you. Thank you. So thank you to um, Rosalba and uh, Luisa there for their um, video presentation. We're back live again now for the fourth and final uh, paper in the session, which is uh, uh, Dependency Trees in Automatic Inflection of Multi-Word Expressions in Polish by uh, Richard Twora and Łukasz Kowalinski, which will be presented by, uh, by Richard. So over to you. Yes, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Richard Twora, and we will be talking about how one can use dependency trees to generate inflections for multi-word expressions, specifically in Polish. Our main motivation is uh, natural language generation. Um, today, template-based methods are still popular and these require filling uh, some slots with uh, prepared data. But for morphologically rich languages, this is uh, more difficult, as we need to inflect the words before putting them into the slot in order for the sentence to be grammatically correct. In this example, the genitive case is needed as opposed to the base form. Uh, moreover, in many use cases, we need to input multi-word expressions as opposed to individual words, which further complicates things. Uh, next slide, please. Um, inflecting multi-word expressions is, is more difficult because of the relations of morphological agreement and morphological governance. Um, in, this, in this example, the adjective modifier biała uh, needs to agree with the noun, the root noun flaga, uh, with respect to number, case, and gender, whereas the nominal modifier papieru is bound by a, a preposition and so does not change under inflection. If we want to obtain proper inflections, we need to take these phenomena into account. Next slide, please. In our study, study, we use two methods for inflecting individual words, and that is a dictionary-based inflector and a neural sec-to-sec -sec generator. Both can then be extended to cover MWEs by using dependency trees. Here we have the dependency analysis of the example phrase. 
And we will use these dependency relations as indicators of morphological agreement. Once we have some idea of where agreements are supposed to happen, we will distribute the desired features from the root throughout the tree being sensitive to agreement. Each word will be then infected using one of these methods individually. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we will need a rule set which represents the grammar of agreement. Uh, the rules will be expressed in terms of dependency relations, and so they will have the form dep to attributes, which means uh, that a particular dependency relation requires the dependency head and the dependency child to agree with respect to this set of attributes. Uh, for example, we can use the paradigm case of adjective modifiers, uh, which leads us to this rule, which uh, means that uh, for uh, an adjective modifier relation, number, case, and gender should uh, fall into agreement. So where can we get these rules? Uh, we have induced them automatically from the biggest dependency tree bank for Polish, which is PDB. And the way we've done so was to calculate the frequency of agreement between the head and the child given a particular dependency label for each morphological feature. If uh, the frequency for a certain feature meets a threshold of 95%, we interpret it as reflecting a syntactical factor as opposed to pure luck or some semantical uh, factors. And so a rule is added requiring that agreement occurs for a given feature uh, given this particular dependency label. Next slide, please. So once we have the rule set and the dependency analysis for a phrase we want to inflect, we can propagate the desired features from the root along the dependency arcs, uh, if the rule set allows such propagation. And so in this case, in our example, we propagate only over the adjective modifier arc from uh, flaga to biała, uh, as this is the only uh, agreement uh, required by uh, the rules. Um, next slide, please. We have evaluated the solution on an inflectional diction dictionary called SAFE uh, using two methods for inflecting words, so a dictionary-based method and the neural method. And we achieve around 90% for dictionary-based methods and around 85% for the neural inflector. Uh, and also, I should mention that a very similar algorithm can be used for lemmatization of multi-word expressions. And for with the, the same data, we achieve around 80% for both methods um for for lemmatization accuracy so uh that is all thank you very much okay thank you very much we'll move to the um question and answer um part of there we don't have very much time left um although we don't have very many questions so uh, it's not going to be a huge problem um the i'd like to invite the speakers to turn on their video um if they'd like to do that um but keep your microphones muted until i call on you um, as well as the speakers that you've already heard, uh, I understand that um, Sigita uh, Ratsky-Vicenie uh, is going to join us. She's a co-author on the second paper. Um, so I've got a question actually to kick things off. Um, it's a question for, for everybody really, which is um, what do you think Clarin could do um, to make as an infrastructure to make projects like yours easier to achieve uh, and more effective? Um, and whoever would like to jump in and um, uh, and answer that would uh, is welcome to welcome to do so. It was, I mean, Thomas, if you have a comment, it was a question I thought of during your presentation, where obviously Claren has provided some support to make that project possible. But what more could it do to make it more effective? Well, uh, exactly. I mean, it was Claren that actually financed the project, right? And the people that. Uh, took part in the project, were also members of Clarin, so I don't really see what Clarin could do more than what it already did. Um, yeah, that's from me. Uh, if I could join. Uh, for our project, it was also, it's already done. I mean, uh, in our proposal, we already uh, saying uh, explicitly that we will upload the data to Clarin and I think it gives strength to the proposal of the project and, and so it, it could be funded. Uh, so <laughs> I don't know if anything more could be done. <laughs> okay, anything to add, Rashad? Um, is there anything you think that ways in which Clarin, uh, uh, 
as an infrastructure could provide more support for your project, perhaps more um, to help with dissemination, sustainability of the outputs, that kind of thing? Yes, well, um, I'm actually benefiting from the, the universal resources such as uh, universal dependencies, Unimov. Um, so uh, these, I think, are not really uh, related very tightly to Clarin, but uh, in general, the, these sorts of universalization efforts to, to bring different languages and different corpora and resources into one annotation format, for example, are very beneficial for, for solutions like these, for creating tools uh, which can automate certain uh, projects, right? Mm, thank you. And Richard, if you'd like to stay on, actually, we, we have um, got a question, um, uh, which thanks you and says, um, this question asked, tried the same task on the Czech language, they had trouble with tagger errors. Um, so she wonders how much your results depend on the quality of the tagging. Um, yes, yes. So that, that is a problem. I'm actually for Polish, I think uh, our taggers are quite well. So um, we're not really having issues of this sort. But uh, the solution that I've implemented is, is uh, using taggers as input, tag taggers output as input. And so it is also dependent on, on any sort of um, any sort of issues you might have upstream. Mm. 